Okay. So welcome back to this uh, second session in the MSc 60 program. And <clears throat> I'm very pleased to uh, uh, start off the session. The first talk is going to be by Professor Rohini Godbole. You heard our director int uh, introduce her earlier this morning. She is a professor at uh, IIC Bangalore. And today she's going to shed some light on dark matter. Afternoon now to all of us. And uh, I thank Ravindran for inviting me here to give this uh, talk. As I mentioned to somebody, if I begin by talking about my association with math science, as well as all the friends I know in math science, the talk would be over. So <laughs> I'm not going to do that. but. Uh, I should say that my association with math science, however, I should say when it began, it began during the directorship of uh, Professor E.C.G. Sudarshan when I was a young postdoc at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And I'm glad to be giving this talk here today when one of the students I knew from my early days of visits to math science is today the director of math science. And in between, I have, you know, visited here, collaborating with friends like Saurabh Rindani, then Rahul Basu, then I have also interacted and worked with Hindu, with uh, uh, and so on, and Sri, and so on and so forth, and Ravindran as well. And apart from physics, there have been a lot of friends, and I say. Congratulations to all of them on the occasion of the 60th birthday of math science. And I noticed that math science is only 10 years younger than I am. So I decided, you know, when I thought what to talk about, I decided that I would give you a flavor of one of the topics that is right now at the forefront of research in particle physics. And luckily I have been able to sort of tell you at the last 10 minutes of the talk about a result which uh, we got uh, recently. And it is kind of a conclusion of study which uh, I had been doing with various people over past 20, 25 years. And we have got a negative, but a conclusive result. So I thought I'll share that with you. So this happy birthday, Math Science. What will I do? So. As I said, dark matter right now happens to be at the forefront of theoretical and experimental research uh, in particle physics, as well as what I would call broadly astroparticle physics. So I'll first tell you what is dark matter. And then I would go to something that has been one of my sort of pet baby, and that is what is the supersymmetric dark matter. And the supersymmetric dark matter, I will introduce a word following Balu, I will also introduce notations. So the lightest supersymmetric particle, I will call it LSP. And I will explain what that is. And then I will, my talk is really about low mass dark matter in supersymmetry. And by low mass, I should set some scale. So I would be talking strictly about a dark matter candidate with a mass less than half the Higgs mass. The word Higgs has been mentioned already, and also Gautam will talk about it in the talk after lunch. But that is one quantity that we particle physicists know quite well, and it is 125.2. So a dark matter particle, which is less than 125.2 divided by 2, is what I am going to be talking about. And I will actually cover only what is written in olive, that is one dark matter, the uh, lightest LSP, lightest supersymmetric particle. But the pointer, does the pointer work? Ah, yeah, here it is. Here. But I will only talk about this LSP in a version of super, minimal supersymmetric standard model, which is the popular beyond standard model physics that particle physicists have been studying for decades and not finding any evidence for. The remaining things in the red are only written for the experts in the audience that there is related work that we have done and I will not be talking here in this talk about it. The particular PMSSM part 
that I mentioned is actually based on these uh, uh, three or four uh, papers that uh, we have written recently and about this latest uh, result that I'm so excited about is in this uh, paper which is still under consideration for publication. So what is dark matter? Apart from saying that this is one subject over which a very large number of particle and astroparticle physicists are working, I should say something more. So what is that? Dark matter is literally matter that does not shine. And in other words, it's a matter, obviously matter has gravitational interaction. So it's matter which has gravitational interactions, but it does not have any interactions with light. This was postulated by Zwicky in about 1933, but really solid evidence by est was established by very detailed observations by Vera Rubin in 1970. And here I may put on my hat as a female physicist and say that it's a great pity that Vera Rubin never got the Nobel Prize for, that she deserved for this. But anyhow, that's the way things go. Now, over the past decades, the evidence for its existence, the existence of the dark matter, has actually grown and it's at all distance scales. Now, what is meant by distance scales? So this is where the astro part of the thing comes in. When I say distance scales, I actually talk about kiloparsec, megaparsec, and gigaparsec. So what is one parsec? For some strange reasons with astronomers use, one gigaparsec is 3.2 light years. Don't ask me why. So it is the distance that light travels in 3.2 years. And we are talking of kiloparsec, megaparsec, and gigaparsec. Just to give you a sense, the distance from sun to earth is eight light minutes. And distance from earth to Jupiter is 43 light minutes. So that should give us an idea of the distance scales at which the dark matter existence has been demonstrated and proved conclusively from a series of astronomical and cosmological observations. What we also know that the dark matter forms 26.8% of the energy budget of the universe. What we also know that they move, it's something that moves around continuously with a velocity of about 200 kilometers per second. And as I said, the direct experimental evidence exists only of its gravitational interaction. It has to be electromagnetically neutral because we don't see it. And it has got to be stable on the scale of the lifetime of the universe for the simple reason that the only idea how it could have been created that we have right now says that it was created at the beginning. In the first, not exactly in the first three minutes, uh, but little bit after the first three minutes. And the dark matter has actually provided the attraction to bind matter together to form galaxies, stars, and everything, all the structures that we so again, the astrophysical evidence is very strong, and these are relics left over from the early universe. The, okay, maybe before I go and say, so what? The point is that none of the, you know, we particle physicists pride ourselves in saying that we now know the list of all the fundamental particles. And the funny part is none of those fundamental particles in the universe can be this dark matter which means that this is unknown to us. It's a completely unknown entity. And this is in spite of the fact that we have this wonderful standard model which was mentioned by Professor Janambara. So this is indeed a mystery. Now, calculations of the expected relic density is actually can be done and it is actually affected by two things. One, that is our understanding of the early universe, which involves standard model of cosmology. And the particle content of the particles in the early universe, which is mostly controlled by the standard model of particle physics. And we must, there must be something beyond standard model at that time in the universe. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had this dark matter hanging around here. So it's a real mystery what it is. And actually, how well, I mentioned that it has implications for structure, structure formation in the universe. So it is somehow saying that in the early universe, dark matter provided the potential wells in which matter formed, matter fell, and that's how all the structures got formed. So that is something, therefore, from very complicated ways, by observations of 
microwave, uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, people were able, are able to establish how much is the amount of this dark matter. And in all these theoretical calculations and the observation, which I will show in the next uh, uh, slide, one actually likes a particle which would actually be moving at non-relativistic speeds, all of us know that at speeds much less than the velocity of light, at the time it decoupled from radiation because in the universe was originally only radiation and somewhere along the line matter was formed. So this, we like actually a particle which is in actually non-relativistic at the time it decoupled and therefore that is called a cold dark matter, very picturesque. And this cold dark matter was something that particle physicists liked very much because the standard beyond standard model physics, which I will tell you in the next slide, which is supersymmetry, had a ready-made candidate for this. And that's why we were all very thrilled when decades ago, astrophy uh, astrophysicists, cosmologists told us that their dark matter should be cold dark matter. So we were very, very thrilled. And that is where we were beginning to worry, started working on it. But now this whole paradigm has come under tension and the reasons for tensions I will give you in the next slide. What has happened is that famously we have found the light Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider 10 years ago. What is meant by light is that it has a mass of 125 GeV, which is close to the mass of the W boson and the Z boson, and not 10 times or 100 times after that. So that's what it's meant by a light Higgs boson. And theoretically, again the power of mathematics, theoretically physicists have uh, sort of uh, liked uh, supersymmetry as a possible postulated existence of supersymmetry because it would actually explain why the observed Higgs boson is light. And as I said, the bonus was that supersymmetry had a ready-made dark matter candidate. So first there exists a dark matter, we have very good measurements, I'm going to tell that in half a slide ago, ago afterwards. But supersymmetry theories, which is what many of us spent a lot of time over the last decades, it had a ready-made dark matter candidate and as I said there are many other reasons why SUSY was the most attractive beyond standard model physics and in other talks given in this auditorium I have expounded on that but today I'm not going to tell you much more about it. So most of us grew up in the period when SUSY was the standard beyond standard model physics because this is one of those beauties where the internal consistency of the standard model had told us that there should exist some physics beyond standard model. The existence of dark matter gives me experimental evidence that there is some physics beyond standard model. Our liked model of beyond standard model physics has a natural candidate for this dark matter. So you see how exciting it was that one thought that yes, once I found the light Higgs boson, now the Large Hadron Collider or some other experiment are going to find me the proof of the existence of this light dark matter. And that is something even before the Higgs was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, as I will show you, many of us were working on how one can look for such a dark matter candidate in different dark matter experiments. And in case I don't get to the end of my talk, what I'm going to show you, the, what we found very recently that in this limited mass range that I'm talking about, we have been able to conclusively prove that all the sets of experiments now tell us that a dark matter candidate, which is supersymmetric, cannot exist below the mass of the, half the mass of the Higgs boson. So at least this is giving you why I'm excited about it and why I want to try and share it with you. So, Firstly, the Large Hadron Collider found the Higgs, but it did not find any other evidence for supersymmetric particles. And all the efforts in the last 10 years have failed. They have only put bounds, bounds, and bounds. And in addition to that, there have been actually underground experiments, and I will use these names in a few slides again. And they have put actually this paradigm of weakly interacting massive particle as dark matter under severe stress. So you have two sets of experiments, very beautiful experiments, but negative results have put this whole idea, which is theoretically and mathematically extremely attractive under a lot of pressure. 
And therefore, as a good theorist who loves the theory, you, we wanted to see, can we, have, can we look for some region, region which has been left out because of these searches? And can we find the evidence in some nook or cranny? And as I said, the result is negative. We find that it is not left in, lived, lives in that some nook and cranny in some under very minimal assumptions. If I change the assumptions, things may change. So what is the point? The point is that Large Hadron Collider has only produced constraints on the masses of a number of supersymmetric particles. And usually these constraints in a theoretical framework translate into parameters of the theory. I don't need to tell you what the parameters are and they are large in number. So about 100, if I were completely free, there will be 123 parameters. But certain theoretical ideas reduce those number of free parameters. But all said and done, the experimental non-observation at the Large Hadron Collider of a whole lot of supersymmetric partners of standard model particles has put constraints on the SUSY parameters. And the, they are constrained to have very high values. But in all this, the only person, only particle, particle that is allowed to be light is what is the lightest neutral, you know, let me define what this neutral, you know, is in the next slide. In supersymmetric theories, there are two natural candidates for the first to begin with. There is no candidate for dark matter in standard model. Neutrino could have been that, but experimental observations told us that neutrino is not the right dark matter. So let's leave that. In the uh, supersymmetric theories, there are two candidates. One is the supersymmetric partner of the neutrino, which is called neutrino, and the neutralino. A neutralino is actually a combination of supersymmetric particle of the Higgs, which are called Higgsinos, and the supersymmetric partners of the W and Z bosons, which I will generally call electroweakinos. So again, definitions, names. So the neutrino actually has full strength gauge couplings to the standard model matter, as a result of that, the detection experiments which tried to detect dark matter has have proved that neutrino can never be a dark matter candidate. So we rule it out and the simplest pictures and the weakest LHC constraints are from non-observations from the LHC are on the mass of the neutralino. So that is a linear combination of the Higgs zenos and electroweak zenos and I'm going to focus on that. So when I say low mass constraints, you will realize that the current constraints, this is from the latest 2021, it says that the LSP, you know, roughly speaking in some generic models has to be the constraints uh, sort of uh, are beginning to rule out LSP masses in this uh, small region and, then the, and uh, this is the region that we wanted to critically evaluate because these limits here actually depend on certain assumptions. So we decided to critically evaluate the case of a light LSP and in general a light electroweak sector. And as I said already, we have been able to show that certain values of a light neutralino mass are almost ruled out if we demand consistency with a number of different experiments both at the accelerator, in the ground, and in the sky. So that is the basically the major lesson that uh, now theoretically do we expect electroweakinos to be light? So the master which I think all of even non-physicists uh, would know about him is Steven Weinberg and as a matter of fact this paper was the reason why I started doing supersymmetry because he had written a paper in 1970, 1983 showing that Electroweakinos can be the lightest parts of the supersymmetric particle spectrum under some theoretical conditions. Okay. So this means that if at all there is a light supersymmetric particle theoretically, which is light, light, it would be the lightest one in the no matter what the spectrum is, could is likely to be an electroweakino. Then there are these measurements of uh, by Planck. Planck was a uh, satellite-based experiment which actually measured the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background radiation and it gave us this rather accurate measurement of the total dark matter density, H here is uh, 
where the scaled Hubble constant, so again, this is astroparticle uh, language. So they, this actually told us that the total dark matter density in the universe is 0 0.120 plus minus 0 0.001. So it's a pretty accurate measurement. And growing in an era when cosmologies, we used to ridicule cosmologies by saying that their errors are in the exponents in the measured quantities. Now here they are, you know, one person, one per mil measurement of a actual energy density in the universe. Now in a model like a theorist, uh, like mo mo most of us, we, com we can compute the predicted density. Again, I won't go through all the details, but we can predict that the same quantity that is being measured, we can predict in our models. And what is the controlling factor there is this cross section where the two dark matter candidates will annihilate into whatever it will do. And this sigma cross section of this annihilation times the velocity with which the dark matter would be moving at that time, this is the quantity which really controls in a model the prediction of what a model will predict as a relic. I mean, obviously, if I start with a model, predicts a, which is 10 times what has been observed, the model will be thrown out of the window the minute I write it. So therefore, that calculation is a very important part of the exercise. And as I already said, if the computed omega h square is much bigger than the measured one, the theory would be inconsistent with the observed flat nature of the universe. So that's a very important piece of information. You cannot muck around with what the universe is like. So you have to throw away that model. All right. Now, how do you detect it? You detect it in three different types of experiments. And I will use these words. So I will please again definitions. DD means direct detection. Indirect detection as it is, no definition. And collider searches, which are at the Large Hadron Collider. I have some, what I will say here, has bearing only on these two sets of experiments. But by and large, these experiments also play an important role. So, you know, what is the current experimental status of detection of dark matter? First, I told you existence of dark matter. That's very high. That's very accurate, 0 0.120 plus minus 0 0.001. There is not much space left. Whereas, what is the detection? There has been you know, a whole lot of, uh, again, this is a very changing scenario. And, but what I want to show you here is how quickly the direct detection limits have been, scenario has been changing. In 2018, what the experiments did is that they looked for dark matter. I showed you this. In this experiment, these are these major big detectors of xenon, which are again underground and very complicated experiments. I wouldn't even be able to tell you all the details. And they did not find evidence of a dark matter of the warm, what is called WIMP, I told you, the CDM. And they only put limits. And they said that all we know is that if a dark matter candidate exists with a mass 10 GeV, its cross section should be less than 10 to the 1 point into 10 to the minus 16 centimeters square. That's all it can tell you. Now, this limit actually readily improved quite quickly for larger masses in 2021. And right now, this is very recent, 2022. This is called the LZ result. And these are the three experiments I was telling you about, Xenon 1 ton, Panda X, and LZ. And LZ has been actually the one which has now put a limit on the cross, said that at 30 GeV, a good mass for CDM and a good can, uh, range, here the cross-section all the values of the cross section above 5.9 into 10 to the minus 48 centimeter square have been ruled out. So we decided to ask ourselves a question that with all this information that we have got now, we can theoretically compute relic density. It has been measured very accurately and very strong limits are put on its cross section. That is this guy here. So can we use these three pieces of information and ask a question and answer, how light can a SUSY dark matter candidate be and still be a viable dark matter candidate? What is meant by that? That it should predict the value of the relic density, which is at least smaller than the observed one. Because if it is smaller than the observed one, you can say maybe there are multi-component dark matter. So at least it has to be smaller. If it is equal to it, all the better. Then the second is, 
But here this as I re remind you, this depends on what we assume for the thermal history of the universe. So use standard thermal history at this point. And it should be allowed by the direct and indirect detection of constraints. I mean, this is obvious. So with these three, what can the theory, what regions of the theory parameter space are allowed? So this is the question, at least if I have been able to set the question clearly to you, I'm happy. Because now I'm going to rush through the rest, which are technical, and which only my technical friends would understand. So the relic density calculation, now what is nice about supersymmetry is that in a given model, the relic density calculations and also the dark matter detection cross sections depend on the same parameters, which means it's the same set of parameters which affect both your calculation of relic density and your calculation of cross sections of direct and indirect detection. So this is what it is. And what we knew as thumb rules was that if the dark matter candidate is a purely Vino like or purely Higgsino like, it will have to have masses of the order of 1000 G. So that is not the candidate that I am looking for. I want to see if there is a possibility of having a light neutral, you know. And to do that, I have to play some technical games, but one can still get it. And in fact, this is where we began our story in 2000 when no Higgs boson was found, no evidence, no information was there about supersymmetric masses. And what we showed at that time, the, the density measurements, the, what I showed you as 0.120 plus minus 0 .0, 0 0.001, at that time, the, the measure, measurement of relic density was 0 0.1 less than omega h square less than 0.3. So you see what was the wide range of allowed relic densities by those measurements. And what we had shown at that time is that when we get the Large Hadron Collider, we will be able to look for what are called invisible decays of the Higgs. And we should be able to check whether the dark matter candidate is allowed in this mass range where the Higgs can decay into two uh, neutralinos. And we already had a, a particle physics already an idea of the Higgs boson mass that it would be around 120 GeV. So this particular plot uses a value of 120 GeV, 125 is the current value. So till the dark matter ex detection experiments came in full swing, the collider bounds and the measurements of the omega H calculations of relic density, that means basically the theorist ruled the game. And actually this condition continued till 2017 when, and as I said, in between, uh, uh, before the, uh, when the collider, when the, after the Higgs was found, we had actually shown uh, how an, in, you know, how an invisibly decaying, how do you see an invisibly decaying object? So actually we had made some suggestions and which were followed by the experimentalist. And this is how you can actually look for an invisibly decaying Higgs. So now we come to this situation where we have, now we have this situation which is completely different from 2000. We have precise determination of relic density. We have very strong constraints from the direct detection. We have the LHC searches for electroweakinos saying that we have not seen anything. Then there is a Higgs detection and the measurements of the properties of the Higgs which get affected by the existence of supersymmetric particles. There are precision calculations of the Higgs mass, which also get affected by the supersymmetric particle masses. And the measurements of the invisible width of the Higgs, which as I said, we had suggested a method and which the experimentalist followed. So with all this information, what can we now say? From that funny plot, which I showed you here, where everything was allowed, a lot, because green means allowed, OK? So a whole lot of things were allowed in 2001 by experiments. But now what happened? Now we did this in 2017, this exercise. And as I said, I'm going to look, analyze it in what is called the phenomenologically, the phenomenological minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. And then the number of 123 parameters are reduced. There are only a six handful of parameters on which everything depends. And that's what uh, I will show you the results on. You don't need to look at this. So what did we do? We make sure that a given point is allowed by the variety of the constraints coming from the Large Hadron Collider, from Large Electron Positron Collider, flavor constraints coming from the B physics, Higgs physics, K 
calculate the invisible branching ratio for the heat at this time mind you good measurements of invisible branching ratios were not available this is 2017 and then uh, we calculated the expected direct detection cross sections calculated the relic density and only if the ratio of the relic density calculated to the observed one was less than one we said we will use that point and then what did we get in 2017 very nice in fact what i, what I plot here is uh, allowed mass the mass of the dark matter, matter particle and if the region is indicated by a green color that means that was still allowed by all the experimental constraints at that time and the blue meant that this was something that was could be and this also actually was allowed but also could not be probed by any data available at that point. So this is something future experiments will do. This is what we had seen. And there were two deep valleys, one around half the Z mass and half the Higgs mass. And we were very pleased. We said, okay, this is allowed. And maybe the future experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, at the International Linear Collider, can look for the invisible decay of the Higgs and can look for the light dark matter. So we were quite thrilled. It was allowed by all the experimental constraints at that time. Came 2018 and I showed you the first plot from Xenon 1 ton. And you see the number of points, this is the same plot, okay? The same points from here and all the allowed points are gone. In near the Z pole, we had almost no points left. And near the Higgs, half the Higgs mass, we had a few points left. So we said, okay, now we need to do a little more careful study. And also we had left sign of one particular parameter called mu to be positive. So we decided now we will be a little bit more careful, let's do this. And that is because other people had done some studies which had shown that they had found many more points in this region, in this region that we had found none. So we decided we will do a little more exploration around the thing. So we did that. And that is where the final result that I want to share you comes in the next two slides. So this we did in June 2022. And we had this paper ready and what we found was that uh, what you see here is that the direct detection cross section, there's a new experiment called Panda X. I showed you from Xenon 110 to Panda X, there was a factor 10 improvement in certain mass regions. So we found that after our serious studies that Green means always allowed. So what we found is that for positive value of mu, we found no allowed regions for mass less than mz by 2, which is 945, and no points allowed, uh, many points still allowed for m Higgs by 2. So we were quite again thrilled. And what is meant by the uh, blue, yellow points? Yellow means that they're allowed, they give the right relic. So first you do whether it gives the right relic, then you ask whether the LHC constraints allow it, and then you say, okay, now how can the LHC at high luminosity look for it? That was our whole purpose. And then to our, of course, when we did for mu less than zero, which was the, the same thing, we did actually found, find a few green points at MZ by two also. So we said, okay, now can we do, can we, so, we actually studied great detail, spent a lot of time and told our experimentalist friends, yes, you can look for these points and then you can, if it, it's supersymmetry is there, you should find it there. Then came the experimental result in, uh, this is uh, July, this new result LS, LZ, and now everything that we thought was allowed is now disallowed. But that is what I meant by saying that now data are really telling us that a low dark matter particle, which has a mass less than, you know, mH by two is highly, highly disfavored. And whatever is still very, you know, allowed, because there are a few points that are allowed. I told you always the, here now, my, this thing has slightly changed. Uh, the, here there is a different color code. But uh, what is, uh, whatever are the points that are there, the deep, deep colored points are still allowed. So you would say there are still few allowed points, but uh, what we have seen at these allowed points are very close to the limit that LZ has put, which means that, L and LZ it had just given results for 60 days of running. So in the future, it's going to be able to probe them, probe them very accurately. And 
these points here, which are way below LZ also, these points are going to be probed by the invisible Higgs bit measurements, which I cannot now, I do not want to go into. But what it's really telling us is that the majority of the, and if, as, uh, particularly for um, MH by 2, the region at M, M, M chi 1 not equal to MH by 2 is simply ruled out and the other regions are also highly disfavored. And not only that, that is something that the very upcoming experiments in the Large Hadron Collider as well as the direct detection experiments are very soon going to be able to rule out for you. So as I say, it's a negative result. But what it's showing you is that the power of different measurement tools and the importance of different measurement tools to be able to probe a particular small region of the theory space. So it's a big game and a long game for particle physicists. I just wanted to share with you the kind of work that one has to put in even to rule out something. So that's really the conclusion that the WIM paradigm for a light LSP in PMSSM as thermal dark matter, I have put all kinds of, as you can see, all kinds of qualifiers. It's only because I'm assuming standard cosmology. It's only because I'm assuming PMSSM. But let me tell you that even with these kinds of uh, qualifiers, it was not possible to make this negative statement till very recently. So I wanted to share that with you. The case is different for non-minimal extensions. And in fact, we are working on that. What I did not discuss, which is even more exciting, that even if I didn't want, even if I didn't demand that the relic was less than the observed relic and say that maybe in the, I don't understand early universe, something strange happens in the early universe and it still allows me to have a dark matter candidate in that parameter range. What we did show is that in that case, you, your large hadron collider will be able to probe it and tell you it doesn't exist, which is kind of very exciting that even if you were to remove the assumptions of that you, your knowledge about early universe, you still can probe with the Large Hadron Collider the entire story, which is very exciting, at least as far as, as a particle physicist, I feel. And as I said, therefore, all the scenarios can indeed be tested at the high luminosity LHC, at the International Linear Collider, and the future dark det detection, direct detection experiments. So this is just to tell you that the particle physicists usually have to trudge a long, long way before they can draw a conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that nice talk. And we have a small memento that we'd like to present to you. Oh, yeah.